Welcome and thank you for joining us on Disrupt TV. My name is Vala Aksha. I'm the Chief Digital Evangelist at Salesforce and your co-host for the next hour. We welcome you to follow us on Twitter at Disrupt TV Show. Send Ray, myself, and our distinguished guests your questions live using hashtag Disrupt TV, and we'll do our best to answer them during the show. It's my pleasure to introduce my co-host. He is the CEO and founder of Constellation Research. He's the best-selling author of Disrupting Digital Business and regular contributor to Harvard Business Review, ZDNet, and many media uh, outlets. And in my humble opinion, he's one of the top futurists to follow on Twitter at RWANG0. Welcome, Ray Wong, to Disrupt TV. Hey, thanks a lot, Vala. I'm here with my co-host. He's one of the most amazing followers on Twitter. CIOs, CMOs, and CEOs around the world follow every word he says on Twitter. Uh, he's a best-selling author himself, and more importantly, a keynote speaker, and on TV a lot. But this is really not about us. Uh, we're really here to talk about what's next, what's hot, who's there, and who's behind all this. Who's our first guest, Vala? We are delighted to have Arun Ramaswamy as the Chief Technology Officer for Nielsen Global Connect as our first guest. Um, Arun is focused on end-to-end -end transformation of Nielsen CPG and retail focused segments with tools like machine learning, the cloud, social, mobile, and analytics. In his role as CTO of Global Connect, Arun has overseen continued refinement of Nielsen's Connect, Connect platform, further enhancing and evangelizing industry-leading cloud-based solutions. He's played a key leadership role in use of AI and deep learning to help identify products on retail shelves using image recognition as one example of incredible innovation. He has 134 patents. That's it? Just 134? What the heck? <laughs> so, like, when I read that, I'm like, oh my God, I could add up all the guests we've had over five years that don't have 134 patents. So he's proven to be the most prolific inventor at Nielsen. He has served in various technology and engineering roles in Nielsen since he joined the company in 2001, most recently leading their global engineering force. You can follow Arun on Twitter at Rama0413, R-A-M-A-0413. Welcome, King of Patents, Arun, to Disrupt TV. <laughs> Thank you, gentlemen. Glad to be here. <laughs> that's, a, that's amazing. That, I mean, how do you store those plaques? In your home. I know. Like, what, do you, what do you do with it? Do you like a whole dedicated four walls or five? I mean, I don't so know. actually, we shifted from a plaque to actually getting a coin. So coins are easier to store. <laughs> yeah, ah, the patent awesome. coin. All right. Well, hey, let's start with the com conversation point that you've been talking about very actively. And it's really about brand authenticity and, and trust. Right. One of the things we've been talking about since the social revolution in 2010 is trust is the new currency. Um, and, and for you, really, what role can brands play in proving that this trust dynamic? Because it's almost it's 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 almost core to the brand, yet everybody keeps forgetting about it. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, right. So you know, if you think about like trust, uh, it's multidimensional. Uh, by that I mean, you know, if you think about what consumers want from a brand, it may be typically like okay, first off, there's a quality aspect. That is uh, the value they get from the product. You know. That's one aspect of it. In fact, you would see with this recent coronavirus uh, thing is, you know, some of our research shows that, you know, uh, consumers have actually shifted from looking from value to more of like quality, right? They're looking mm -hmm. for some of the more key products they're seeking on the shelves that actually derive more uh, quality for them. And they are also like focusing on the supply chain, right? The transparency that the brand brings in, in terms of the supply chain uh, and how open that is. Uh, but also, you know, the, the, the key part is also that, you know, it's all a data play. Uh, in many, many of these brands, it's all about data. And when you think about data, yes, you know, it's a two-way street between the consumer and, and the brand. But what's really important when, when you look at it from a consumer's perspective, it is about making sure that, you know, brands look out for privacy. Um, you know, there are obviously a lot of regulations in this area. Uh, but the more importantly, they're also looking for security, right? Mm -hmm. So in my opinion, when you want to see a brand, you know, earn the trust of a, of a consumer, it's a longer, it's a long-term play, right? It's not an instant, hey, I'm going to just uh, switch it instantly and I'm going to be now a trusted partner of the uh, consumer. It's a longer-term commitment by the brand playing along those dimensions. And that's ultimately how you gain the trust of the consumer. Sure, sure. You know, as Ray said, it is multidimensional. And, you know, you're a scientist, you're an engineer, you're a super inventor. So when you think about artificial intelligence and machine learning and more automation, more autonomy, 
you have the role of data, as you mentioned, there's permissions, there's consent, there's security. All of these things shape the brand promise, the mission, and the ultimately, hopefully, the advocacy of your stakeholders, your employees, your customers, your business partners, the communities that you serve. How do you develop algorithms? How do you create models where you can look at defining trust and advocacy in this ever-changing world that we're a part of? You know, a third of humanity is 18 years or younger. So these digital natives have different, perhaps, expectations and definitions of trust versus our parents. Um, talk to us about how you think about measuring trust based on all these different dimensions. Right, so you know, technology has a great role to play in actually enhancing the trust factor, right? So when you think about data, and people often use the word big data, right? Uh, mm. They talk about the breadth of data. You know, when we look about data, we look at it not just the breadth, but you know, how deep can you go, right? Can you mm. think about deep data sets, but that might be smaller, right? So the point I'm trying to make here is that when you design systems, when you think about data, you've got to think about the lineage. You've got to think about the provenance, right? You need to think about what rules have been entitled like for those use of those data sets. And that goes down directly into the way you design your systems, right? So, so for example, you may have an entitlement uh, around it, around the data sets that will, an algorithm would have to respect in terms of what it can do. What are the guardrails of usage? Where does it go? Right, so these are really key points. So this way you don't lose track of really the usage of data because that goes back directly to the point I was trying to make earlier, which is about trust, right? So as long as you can demonstrate, I mean, if you think about like opt-in and opt-out rules, it's really fundamentally mm -hmm. about someone telling you that you don't have use for it, you don't have the use to use it, right? So these are directly in consequence and, and this is where technology, right? And algorithms have to actually safeguard the entitlement rules that, that, you know, that come along with the data sets. Makes sense. Ray, you on mute. Uh, and related to that, we have to talk about what's happening with, you know, the, the, the ethics of this, right? I mean, and, and you started to touch upon on this, you know, whether, you know, you chose to opt in or you chose to opt out or how that data is being used or the consent of it, right? I mean, but, but, but customers inherently are happy to give more information um, with permission if they see value in the exchange, right? And, and, and some of the stuff that you guys do is really help people see where that value could lie. There's some examples of like, you know, what gets, what creates that kind of uh, relationship between the value, the trust and the sharing of that data. Yeah, so, uh, you know, Nielsen, uh, the, you know, has a huge uh, sort of historical precedent on creating this trust with the consumers, right? We are a market, you know, research company. We have, we have been measuring consumers for a long time. And you know, one of the ways that we actually measure consumers is actually with through panels. And when you set up panels, right, you actually have this relationship with the, with the consumer mm -hmm. whereby you seek permission on what sorts of data sets you're going to collect and what are you going to do with it, right? right? And in anything that we do with the data, we absolutely do not deal with PII, right? So the data set at some point in the life cycle gets anonymized, mm -hmm. right? And we actually make sure that you know, we, we are all compliant with all the regulations and what you can do with those data sets. The same thing with when we deal with like third party vendors that, you know, give us uh, data sets. So because in today's world, you cannot solve everything with just running your own panels, right? It's about an omni-channel world where you have to uh, get data sets from perhaps sometimes from your clients. You may have to get data sets from the third parties. You have to get data sets from your own, um, um, you know, your own panels. And of course, one of the value add that we have is to put those data sets together in order to construct a sort of a 360, 360 degree view of the consumer. So you got to put the same sets of regulations and you got to treat the data sets the same way when you think about the lineage, the provenance, the rules, the ethics behind it, and you know, what sort of um, you know, compliance you institute. So this way, no data set actually leaves our premises that just you know, lies out in a stray. So that's really key in the way we design it. That makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, we've heard in this, hyper-connected knowledge sharing economy, this post-digital economy where mobile social analytics are table stakes and companies need to lean into more emerging new technologies like AI, like additive manufacturing, 3D and extended mixed reality with augmented and virtual reality, sensors and IoT. How do you, how do you take advantage of AI and maybe per, per, as an example, if image recognition in terms of creating mass personalization at scale capabilities and more importantly, the ability to anticipate what your consumers need and, and, and respond to that 
where you're creating value at the speed of need. Okay, um, you know, let me let me just give you like a very quick update on what's happening in the industry of image recognition, right? So the world today has gone from this traditional image recognition techniques, right, which, which served pretty well, to leveraging yep. AI and deep learning, whereby you don't really tell the machine what patterns to look out for. The machine actually determines those patterns by itself, right? What you have to do is to create tremendous amount of labeled data in order for those decisions to happen. Now, one of the cases that we have been using image recognition is we often, like I said, we collect data sets from different channels. One of the channels is actually to send people to the store to figure out what's on the shelf. Yeah. And in the past, one used to, you know, they used to, we used to record it, we used to barcode scan it. But today, in many cases, we actually just snap a picture of the shelf and that gets uploaded to our cloud. Um, and then behind the scene, these algorithms kick in to automatically recognize the product and to a very granular state, right? The, the product, the promotion, the pricing, we use a variety of different AI techniques. Now that's an example of how we use AI in order to create more efficiency and accuracy into our system. Sure. Now the same thing is happening in the industry. You mentioned for, you know, personalization, mass personalization, right? So we, you know, there are many companies that leverage similar techniques. So for example, to find out how do you, you know, I've seen examples where certain makeup, you know, companies that create makeup products, right? You can have consumers take selfies and they automatically detect the skin tone and make a recommendation of what it is there. You know, there are also examples where instead of actually going to a brick and mortar store, you can actually snapshot a picture and the AI engine can make recommendations of, you know, what it determines. But behind the scene, there is the same rec image recognition aspect there is a context, you know, the sort of a contextualization happening because context is really, really important, right? You don't want to be making recommendations in a wrong context. So right. that uh, context creation is really important. And of course, all the other technologies like, you know, you know, 5G and AR and VR, you know, the smartphone cloud, they're all sort of playing this ancillary role in this fundamental sort of mass personalization endeavor that's happening in the industry. So, so Arun, do you think, like right now, I think the last time I looked at some data in terms of e-commerce as a percentage of total commerce, and this may have been specific to U.S., uh, this, I believe a $4 trillion market, only 15% of commerce was digital. But there's projections that by 2030, this may be at 50% of commerce is digital. Do you think these technologies where you can take a selfie and immediately get the best recommended skin tone makeup reduces the need to go into a store because now you have a digital advisor that can serve you at home with convenience. And with companies like Prime, you could get that product in your house in a couple of hours. Uh, are these technologies fueling greater adoption of digital commerce or are the experiences so good that you want to come into the store or both? I think it's a combination of both. Look, you know, sometimes people do want to touch and feel products. They want to see, yeah. right? So I'm not going to go, you know, I'm not going to debate that. But definitely the technologies are definitely going in like between AR, VR, the things that you mentioned, right? Just in time production, supply chain, you know, uh, advances in, in, in a lot of that, like try it before you buy it, you know, the whole concept. I mean, these are all examples whereby it's sort of the friction that existed in people feeling comfortable with the product, right? Before they bought them is going away, right? Um, you know, technology like image recognition cleans up this whole area of metadata, you know, cleansing, like someone wants to call it product A, someone wants to call it product B, you know, sometimes the images actually tell you the truth what the product might be. Right. Uh, the other example is, I mean, you know, even in this sort of difficult situation we are in today with like the, you know, the, 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 the health crisis that's going on, right? You see a lot of people biasing themselves to actually against going to the store, but trying to go online, right? So you may have this ecosystem play that might be pushing in this direction and that anything these technologies are doing to reduce that sort of friction and make it easier, I think that's the trend. I think that's going to continue a lot. Sure, I agree. Yeah, well, hey, while you're talking about that, I think there's, there's questions really about all these different technologies providing context, right? So anything from delivery, pick up online, buy online, pick up in store, um, figuring out return in store, we got a whole bunch of different different types of delivery wars, um, you know, from anything from food delivery services to what's actually happening to, you know, one hour delivery services to this whole supply chain. And there's a question really about, you know, what, what is the shift? Like, where are we in these technologies? Is it really about a location thing? Is it really about a context thing? Is it really about where data is sitting in the future? Like, how do you guys look at that? And, and how does that come back to where we are thinking about the customer uh, in those technologies. 
So, you know, look, it's an omnichannel world, right? So I think the fundamental uh, uh, shift that's happening is that a lot of the technology providers, retailers, you know, they're looking at providing the same level of experience to the end consumer, no matter which channel it is, right? They want to make it seamless. So they're coming in from that direction, right? So all the technologies that you talked about, you know, the context creation, location, um, you know, your past purchase habits, your behavior, all the signals that are generated, right? So the products, the, you know, they're all moving in that direction to make that purchasing seamless. And so when we look at it from our perspective and we want to measure the end consumer, our strategy is also like a multi-channel, omni-channel world, right? So for us, we don't assume any one thing now anymore, like right? that the consumer is going to go only to one channel to watch. So you got, you got to be able to go and, and tackle all these channels and, and the, ultimately the value add that you create for our clients is to be able to put these data sets together, right? So that's the, hence the name connect, uh, where you can put these data sets together to actually make sense right. out of, it of what's happening, right? So I, I can see this coming in both directions and, and both the directions, you know, the consumer is right in the middle. You talked about uh, data, you talked about permissions, you talked about consent as shaping the brand promise. You also mentioned security. Can you talk a little bit about security as a, uh, specific to supply chain? How do you improve security with respect to supply chain management? Yeah, so, so I think that's a, that's a great question, uh, you know, because if, if you think about supply chain, you know, it's a little bit of the conventional ways of sourcing data, right? Where you may have theft, you may have, you know, you know the normal way of piracy and so on and so forth. But a lot of the companies now are like automating supply chain, right? They don't look at supply chain as something separate, right? They look at supply chain analytics connected totally with the end consumer analytics, right? The endpoint analytics. And there is a huge automation push that's happening in supply chain, right? Where cloud plays an important role. Um, you know, and when cloud, when you think about cloud, you've got to think about the right governance structure with cloud, the cloud security that comes with it. Right, so there is a huge push in my opinion. And then also like the endpoint IOT, right? When you think about supply chain and IOT sensors, you know, you want to think about the endpoint encryptions, right? Right, right sort of algorithms that gets the data sets. So you got to look at this as a traditional cyber, cyber security problem and not just a very conventional technique, right? And if you look ahead, a lot of the companies are also investing things like in blockchain. And you know, that brings in other ways to look at supply chain security and uh, you know, the serialization that happens there. So there's a lot cooking, cooking in this direction. I mean, end of the point, it's in my opinion, it's a bit hybrid, but you know, a lot of the companies are actually automating it and trying to look at it as sort of how do you bring the traditional um, the techniques along with the more of the cyber cloud-based techniques together in one, one package. So, so we've talked about everything, but 5G, so might as well go there too. <laughs> We're at it. I mean, how's 5G gonna transform um, some of these retail and shopping environments? I, I think it's going to transform, right? I mean, if you think about the goodness of 5G, I mean, it brings uh, things like uh, much higher speed, right? Um, it brings in lower latency. It brings in much power, better power consumption patterns. I mean, these are all ingredients, in my opinion, to sort of transform this industry, right? And, and you might think about like, where are the areas, right? So if you think about, we talked about supply chain, right? IoT sensors, right? These could be 5G enabled. You thought you, you can think about like in-store execution, right? So are there smart shells that can automatically replenish uh, content? Can they, can these smart shells automatically personalize, right? We talked about image recognition. We talked about AR, VR, sort of immersive experiences in the store or outside the store. Um, everything needs a back channel because we have got to think of it as a connected space. So fundamentally, if you think about 5G and what it brings to the table, it allows you to bring in that backend connectivity. You can think about machine learning at the edge. I mean, there's a whole lot of stuff that's happening. So between in-store execution, you know, end consumer uh, experience, personalization, supply chain, I mean, the entire life cycle, I can see this getting transformed. That's perfect. Wow. I look forward to having you back when you get your 150th patent. <laughs> Actually related to that. Next week. <laughs> Actually related to that, do you have a favorite patent? So. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah I, you know, one of my, so before this, um, before this, um, you know, taking over the connect role, I was actually in the media side of my company. And one of the, one of the patents, which I remember, which is my first patent. So hence, it's my favorite patent was actually about <laughs> figuring out who's watching television uh, in with passive means, right? So if you think about all of the image recognition, nice. and, uh, I, uh, you know, infrared based imaging, 
to figure out like, how do you know who's in front of the TV? We didn't put AI in there, but it was more explicit uh, image checking. That's my favorite path. This was, this was before cameras. Think about this. That's what, cameras yeah, on these exactly. TVs, okay. which is pretty wild. Arun Ramaswamy, Chief Technology Officer of Nielsen Connect. You can follow our Twitter. He doesn't use it much, but it's Rama0413. Or follow at Nielsen, N-I-E-L-S-E-N. Thank you so much for being on the show. You're terrific. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. It was a pleasure. Thanks. Ray, how often wow. do you guess that I have 134 patents? Uh, you know. <laughs> I, I think it's a first for us here. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty amazing. Awesome. I'm guessing it's pretty amazing. Got, you know, a couple dozen yeah. patents. But uh, <laughs> our, uh, our next guest, one of our favorite guests, is Tasha Kini, analyst at ARC Investment Management. Tasha joined ARC um, 2014 as an analyst for Industrial Innovation Strategy and 3D Printing ETF. Tasha also covers autonomous cars, additive manufacturing, infrastructure development, and innovative materials. Previously, Tasha worked as a management consultant for Applied Value, working primarily with manufacturing and automotive clients. She's an awesome follow on Twitter at Tasha Ark, T A S H A A R K. Welcome back, Tasha, to Disrupt TV. Good to see you all again. Thanks for having me. Good to see you. Yeah, welcome back. You're on episode 74, 140. This is the third episode. You know, this is awesome. We're going to have to have a show with you. So, so we've gone from, you know, the market talking about, you know, the search for yield to where beta is to what's going on in Europe. Of course, these awesome big tag capabilities to only one word this week. <laughs> what's the impact of everything we've been talking about on TV for the last week? Um, about what the coronavirus hits, especially for, for a company like Tesla in China, on the demand side and the supply side. Um, Post-coronavirus, post are they okay? Where are we today? So. Yeah, so if, if you look at the auto industry broadly, um, I mean, you know, we already saw sort of a, a slowdown in auto sales. And now, and, and the incumbents have been, try, have been struggling to make uh, electric cars and autonomous cars, um, you know, for the past few years, really. Um, so now coronavirus hits, um, and, and sort of the, the long-term impact that we had always thought would happen from autonomous EVs is that the industry would consolidate mm -hmm. and that, um, you know, players that weren't successful on those technology platforms might not be around in the next 10 years. I think what will likely happen now, um, due to this, uh, due to COVID-19 is, um, that it could accelerate that consolidation effort. It's just one more thing that, you know, the traditional companies that were already lagging have to deal with. For a company like Tesla, um, I'd say, one, it's, it's great that they have the, um, the Chinese manufacturing facility up and running. Of course, they had to pause it like everyone else, but they already have that facility there so they can, you know, resume production. And it's good to have boots on the ground and it's wholly owned. Um, yep. With Tesla's broadly, I mean, this is actually the only car in the world with bio defense mode. So, you know, if you're, you're really I worried, maybe you want to camp out in your Tesla. <laughs> right, right, right. You, uh, I want, I want um, uh, um, kind of a summary of um, a, a, a forecast that you published January 31st uh, of this year. And it was based on a 20, 2024 projection, long-term view of Tesla. And there was, um, you know, a, a, a bare estimate uh, of of, of seven thousand for Tesla stock to a to to a to a, a bull estimate of, of fifteen thousand. Um, I'm sorry, a bear estimate of fifteen hundred. Fifteen hundred. Yes. Yes. And a bull bull of fifteen thousand. And the, your projection was around seven thousand. If you think in yes. twenty twenty four. And you talked about gross margin, capital efficiency, uh, autonomous capability, and you gave ranges from, for example, gross margin, bear projection of 33% versus 57% for bull. You gave a market cap, bear of 300 billion. Now, you know, Tesla last month was trading at 900 with almost 200 billion. Today, it's about 100 billion, $525. So massive volatility. Um, but yeah. the bull, bull projection, was three trillion, if I'm not mistaken. So my question, my question is, do, do you believe that Tesla will be the first and only car manufacturer to hit the trillion market value? Uh, and and give, give us more insights about all of these dimensions because it was a multi-dimensional deep analysis from you and your team in terms of these numbers. And even the bear numbers seem pretty awesome, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, so it's, I, you know, I'd say first, um, you know, our, our long term thesis on electrical on electric vehicles and autonomous cars uh, really remains intact. We've always been, you know, long term investors. So when we talk about those price targets, we're talking about the next five years. Yeah, um, yeah for, for Tesla, um, here, here's how we've been thinking about it. So we think the way forward is electric vehicles. So our estimate is that in five years time, um, there'll be 37 million EVs sold globally. That's a lot higher than most are expecting, but it's because we've done the work to look at the underlying cost of batteries. So we use something called Wright's Law, which says that for every cumulative doubling in production, you get a corresponding reduction in price. Um, if you apply this, and by the way, you can use this and go back over a hundred years in the auto industry, and this law holds up. Um, it's so interesting right now for EVs because it's a smaller install base, so you get that really steep cost decline. So we think in the next couple of years, an EV on a like-for-like like basis will be cheaper than a gas-powered car for a mass market car. That's going to cause this major um, inflection point for demand. So Tesla is the leader in EVs really well positioned. And today, no other manufacturer has beat um, basically the Model S in terms of specs um, for their electric platform. So they're, they're years ahead of the competition. And then, you know, we've learned from China that the company is becoming more capital efficient. You mentioned that's one of the variables we're looking at. And then the last piece is autonomous technology. It's sort of the most uncertain. We're actually only assigning a 30% probability to Tesla successfully launching an autonomous taxi platform. But we think this is a massive opportunity. I mean, one, if that happens, Tesla, it changes from a you know, one-off sales model to a recurring revenue model. And that's huge. We think this market is worth trillions. Um, so that's what gets us to, to that bull price of 15,000. 15, and that 15,000 price, does it assume that Tesla will produce about what, 7 million cars? Yeah, so so the bull is seven million EVs um, sold in in the final year of the in five years time. Um, the bear is about three million, and that's about an eighteen market share at seven million. Yeah, you would assume that their market share stays roughly the same, which where it is today, okay. which Three isn't points. unreasonable. That's they've they've held they've held there um, for the past year or two. So Ray, your thoughts? I know you're uh, you you have a couple of Teslas. So your thoughts? <laughs> Well, well, here's the thing. Like, I, I don't know about the EV market. I know people want Teslas. I don't know if they want EVs. And that's the interesting thing in the mass market. And so I'm, I'm always curious about that. Because when I talk to people, they're just like, oh, yeah, I, 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 try, I, I, I bought a Tesla. I left. I bought something else. I switched back and because, because I didn't have the charging infrastructure or because, you know, I didn't have, you know, you know, it, it's always it was simple features, things that actually happened in it. Like I didn't get the updates. Right. And it, it's become a very interesting thing, especially in the Valley. It's like, you know, it, it, the build quality is not great. Right. It's not the best build quality, but it's the convenience of it. And it's the infrastructure that seems to be pulling everyone back. So I, I don't know where I read, but I read an engineer that actually looked at the interior makeup mechanics automation of a Tesla and thought that other car manufacturers were seven years behind. Uh, Tasha, yep. you, you know, last time we spoke, I, I think yeah. we discussed that Tesla could be three years ahead of other manufacturers, but that yeah. was a year ago. Where, what are your yeah. thoughts today? Yeah, so I mean, to your point, it could be much more than three years, um, but that's sort of our, you know, relatively conservative estimate. And, and I think one of the biggest things that Tesla has over others is this software advantage. Um, so when what we learned from um, teardowns of Tesla vehicles is that because they're totally vertically integrated, you know, they've been able to sort of centralize processing. Basically, like, if you're thinking of bringing together software from five different tier one suppliers as a traditional automaker, it's going to be hard to sort of make all those programs work together. And, and now software is more important than ever. Um, so it, that is a really key advantage. We think that's why Tesla is the only automate, one of the reasons they've, they're the only ones that have over the air updates now, because um, they've always owned that part of the software um, stack, yeah. basically. Yeah. Um, so I, I think that advantage uh, will last for some time. I mean, VW just tried to, um, to, to have over the air updates on one of their latest models, and they actually ended up parking all those cars in parking lots, basically, because they messed up the software infrastructure. <laughs> Actually, I have to do it by hand right now. <laughs> I can't do the over exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. What happened to those guys? But in Tesla, sorry, the flywheel of success. You have invest mm -hmm. in Tesla factory, uh, more autonomous Teslas, uh, and 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 cash generated from autonomous Tesla network. Is that is that essentially the what encompasses their their advantage? 
Yeah, so you can think of, if, if autonomous launches, it's sort of like this, this um, think of it as like a snowball, like building steam. It's like, then, um, you know, th so they're, they're putting more cars on the road that are collecting more data. They're improving the autonomous system. So data is a huge advantage for Tesla. Um, then their autonomous system is better than anyone else's. That's going to give them better pricing too to the consumer on the autonomous taxi front. Um, you know, they could charge premium prices because they could be one of the first to launch, but they're going to have that advantage that their car actually works better and they have the economics. It's going to be really hard to catch up with them. Yeah. And, and I can lease out my car into the pool, right? <laughs> if I'm not driving, I'll just drop it in, right? Like pay me back exactly. for the car, right? So exactly. it's a very, very interesting yeah. things. So, okay. Uh, related to that though, it's like, so your, your basic theory is saying a couple of things, like the EV market and the ride hailing and ride sharing market will converge at some point because of autonomous, right? And yes. when it does converge, right, what happens to the Ubers and the Lyft? Does that go away? And do we actually get autonomous supply chain logistics where these guys are now taking on the 3PL providers or the last mile delivery on the Amazon trucks? Yeah, that's a great question. And actually, so my latest research is I've been looking at um, the ride hailing market because Tesla now for the past couple of quarters has been saying that they would launch a ride hailing platform even before they reach full autonomy, basically to see how the network works, sort of understand the business, get it, get it going. So there'd be drivers. Um, okay, that is a huge problem for Uber and Lyft because on a, on a per mile basis, it's already cheaper to operate a Tesla. So it's better for the driver, they could get more earnings, um, or you know, Tesla could also actually char take a higher cut of the gross revenues than Uber and Lyft yep, do. Yep. So it's a more profitable business for them. Um, yep. So I feel like you know, to be able to convince someone to move over from those platforms, you know, they should be able to make the case for that. And I'd be really worried if I were Uber and Lyft. Longer term, I don't think they have a credible, uh, uh, they have credible autonomous platforms anyways. So they're, they're not gonna enjoy the same economics, Uber and Lyft, as they do today. But uh, near term, this, this Tesla situation is a huge problem for them. Wait, does that change the way we look at, oh, sorry, sorry about that. I was gonna say, does that, would they start with the consumer car on the ride train or would you go for long haul interstate transit on the trucks? Mm, both. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think I think they'll pursue both opportunities. So we've seen, um, you know, that they're, they're they have the semi. They announced that. I, I think, um, you know, sort of all around. Um, we've actually modeled that an autonomous electric truck could make transporting goods cheaper than rail. So that's that's we yes. think. Um, and and truck in the U.S. trucks and rail are roughly half and half in terms of ton mileage for goods that go over the yeah. network. So that's a that's a big addressable market that that could be grabbed. Um, and, and it could be really disruptive for, for rail as well. So, so yeah, I, I, think, I think they'll pursue both. I think the larger opportunity is definitely the, the passenger taxi market, um, but okay. yeah. And the passenger taxi market, is that baked into the forecast for 2024? In the bull case it is. In the bear in the case, case, we're assuming, yeah, in, in, in the bear case, we're assuming that they're just an electric vehicle company. Yeah. So, you know, what if autonomous never happens, but yeah. Okay, so uh, opportunities in, uh, in additive manufacturing, 3D printing, uh, our, our, our last guest uh, talked about the importance of that in, in, in terms of innovation at Nielsen. Can you give us an update uh, on, on, on that front? Yeah, well, actually, you know, something really interesting that's happening right now with coronavirus, I'd say on both autonomous and, and 3D printing. So we're seeing a lot more autonomous trials. Um, Waymo, Alibaba, um, I'm so sorry, Meituan is what I meant to say, Alibaba, Meituan. JD, all testing in, in China. Um, and then here in the US, uh, UPS just announced um, with Matternet, they're starting to transport medical samples with drones. They've been doing some trials for some time. So mm -hmm. if you think if the, if the, you know, the, the guidance is for people to sort of um, social distance, don't go out as much, then now's the time to test drones. Um, so I think that could really accelerate. Um, and then for 3D printing, we're seeing a lot of, we think there'll be a lot of supply shortages. So we're already seeing port, part shortages in the automotive industry. I think this is going to extend to the rest of manufacturing. And that's actually how 3D printing first started making its way into aerospace. So Airbus is basically going to be late on some of its um, promised part runs. And they needed some technology to help them make the parts in time. And they started using 3D printing. Now they still use it today. They use Stratasys technology. So I think this could be, although there'll be this pause initially um, be, due to, you know, sort of um, uh, cautious purchasing decisions um, in terms of the machinery itself, 
Um, I, I think this could be a time when the adoption of these technologies actually is, is more rapid than you'd expect. Uh, we got some comments here on the uh, on the chat. You know, Toyota exec at CCE said Korea build quality for vehicles, but electronics integration of software far ahead of everybody. Uh, would you agree with that statement at Tesla? So, um, yeah, I th this is Tesla's further ahead. Yeah, I think um, I you know I I do think that sort of to your point, the manufacturability um, we think of as something that can be that can be worked on, sort of you know improving like the trim on the vehicle. Um, it seems to be a much harder problem for the traditional auto industry to, to go after sort of that software technology advantage. And certainly on the data side, I mean, they're just miles ahead, literally have, you know, billions of miles of data um, versus, yeah, yeah they're winning on that. You know, multi, yeah, exactly. So I'm going to do the mashup, right? So, so 3D printers with the delivery on the autonomous vehicles creates a brand exactly. new part supply chain market, right? I mean, is that what you're saying as well then? would take this like two or three levels out yeah yeah you know innovation overlaps you, um, you, we're just you, you all were just talking about ai i mean yeah. ai is really making its way through every industry you can think of 3d printing as an automated process um and so and with autonomous you know it's like it's coming from all angles it's cars it's drones it's it's vehicles that roll on the ground that are, that are little robots um so we we see a lot of convergence happening now sort of across yeah. all all of these areas you work on all these like amazingly big ideas, and uh, and uh, that's why we love having you on the show. Any, can you give us any more? You know, uh, what are some of the other big uh, research areas that you're looking at throughout 2020 and beyond? Well, well, Arc um, is really interested in a number of areas. Um, you know, genomics is a big area for us, so we think. Uh, you know, with again the, the recent health concerns, um, certain companies are making a lot of progress there. We're seeing some exciting results. Um, we look at um, mobile payments and fintech a lot, um, sure. which is also something that could be accelerated. Of course, contactless mm -hmm. payments. You don't want to deal with cash. Um, so, uh, so yeah, we're sort of seeing across the board a lot of interesting trends. Um, I'd say broadly in the the drone space, I've been doing some more work on food delivery and e-commerce. We think it could totally change shopping behaviors. Um, uh, you know, we think a, a large amount of e-commerce could be delivered by drone in the next um, 10 years. And on the food side, you could actually see food delivery as a percentage of total food spend increase dramatically because drones now make it a lot easier for, yeah. for instance, people in the suburbs to get food from restaurants and, and sort of that quick delivery window. So. Yeah, I know a lot of innovations in the last mile that are happening and definitely talking about those and seeing those. Um, so, so other areas around this industrial, you know, evolution, revolution that's going on. Um, what are other topic areas like you've seen Horizon 2, Horizon 3 uh, that might pop up that people might not normally think about? Um, well, let's see, topics that people might not normally think about. Well, actually, well, I'll, I'll say one, one question that we've been getting a lot is around sort of oil. Um, and, and so, so our estimate for autonomous and EVs is that this will reduce global oil demand significantly. Sure. Um, and, and right now we're seeing, you know, oil prices coming down and there's this question of, will that affect the electric vehicle market? Um, what we're finding is, you know, one of the reasons we think sticker price matters so much is because consumers aren't doing the math on the rest of the car at all. Because if you were, you'd know today that it's actually cheaper from a total cost of ownership basis to get the right. EV, but they're yeah, not. That's why I bought one. That's why I bought <laughs> one. Yeah, right. yeah there, we, there we go. Yeah, you're, you're among the, the few, the few, yeah. <laughs> so, um, so, so we don't think that sort of this recent um, change in oil prices is going to affect um, electric vehicles, uh, you know, broadly. And, and then also like fuel savings as a pretend, as is, is just one piece of the puzzle. You also get maintenance savings. There's like a performance efficiency. So it's, you know, we, we don't think that people are using just that to make, to make their decisions. So I, I think that's, that's another sort of interesting well, relevant plus, topic today. Plus free, plus free supercharging, right? So, so if we take, if we take the oil market, right? So Saudis just basically, and the Russians declared war on U.S. shale, right? They're basically taking a call out on basically the loans that they have for all the investments for shale. U.S. shale production is at about $32 cost. Saudis can actually crank out oil at eight bucks a barrel and, and the Russians can do it at 28, right? That compression, if oil sits at under 30 bucks a barrel, um, I mean, it, it, you're basically saying that there's no, there's no impact to any EVs. It won't mean like people are going to buy more regular cars it's, and it's not going to impact any EVs at all um, in, in that equation. 
we, we longer term, you know, we think EV technology makes sense because um, gas powered cars are just not riding the same cost decline curve and they, they can't because they have a larger install base so that, you know, with rights law that cumulative doubling would take much, much longer for, for the gas infrastructure. Um, for, uh, I'd say for, for oil, you know, it's not necessarily my expertise. I know my, um, my boss, Kathy Wood, would say that um, we're yeah. seeing, we're seeing, you know, a lot of changes in, in capital spending in the oil sector. So I think in terms of like where the price is going to go um, near term, uh, you know, we, we, we're, we're not so sure necessarily that it'll stay at today's levels. A lot of people are sort of pulling oh, But it's awesome. But you're, you're basically saying it's inelastic to any oil pricing for the EV demand, which means oil pricing should not be a factor, I think. Is that kind of what, yeah, what's going on? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. We, we think that that's... Um, you know, they're, they're, yeah, that, that's one piece of the puzzle, but we don't think that's driving purchasing decisions. So that's, and that's it's not yeah. even hitting purchasing, which is even more interesting. Okay. Only so there's no relationship. Like Ray. Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's amazing. It's, it's no relationship. <laughs> actually, I, I saw, I think I did see your boss on CNBC yesterday. Actually, uh, I think someone was doing an interview or Bloomberg. I, was, I think it was Bloomberg, but anyways, yeah. So cool. Well, this is wonderful. We're seeing the latest update here, getting all the latest ideas of what's happening in the EV market. 3D printing, and also awesomeness around what's happening on Thomas Vehicles. So with Tasha Keeney, analyst at ARK Investment Management. You can follow her on Twitter at Tasha A-R-K. Thanks a lot for being on the show. Stay safe. So. You were terrific. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much. Crushed it as usual. Uh, we got to have her on our show more often. Just so much insight packed in 20 minutes. My head's spinning. Uh, so... Well, uh, you're about to spend more now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I mean, trust me. Uh, this is not a guest that's going to slow down uh, my head spinning. It's our privilege to, this is a cleanup hitter spot, by the way, where only first ballot Hall of Fame uh, disrupt inductees get invited to, uh, to close the show. Brian Fanzo, digital futurist keynote speaker who translates the trends of tomorrow to inspire change today. He's incredible. Brian's customized and personalized program showcase real world stories, example of forward thinking people and businesses. He teaches companies of all sizes. I mean, all sizes, the biggest from Dell, EMC, Adobe, IBM, all, all sizes, UFC, <laughs> to, 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 to be forward looking to engage with their customers in the right manner at the right time. He has a gift for bringing people together online and offline. Most of the time we've had him on the show, he's been on the streets, whether it's Super Bowl, South by Southwest, it's kind of weird to see him in an office. <laughs> I know, <they're> rare. <laughs> I know. I have the mic. We know I, uh... why. We know why. He's been recognized as a top digital transformation influencer, top 50 most mentioned user by CMOs, uh, top 25 social business leaders uh, for the future by The Economist. These are incredible, reputable brands. His followers on social media, his podcast downloads rank him in the hundreds of thousands of engaged fans around the world. And that's why he's one of the most influential people. And 19 of the Fortune 100 companies partner with him to get their stories out in a meaningful way. An incredible must follow on Twitter is iSocialFriends, I-S-O-C-I-A-L-F-A-N-Z. And by the way, Brian was on episode one of Disrupt TV and here we are five years later, and this is his eighth appearance. So by far the most popular guest we have. Welcome <laughs> back to Disrupt TV. <laughs> Thank you guys for having me. I, I need to shorten that bio for that. I mean, I've been here eight times. Uh, I feel like that's like, <laughs> every time, dude. I dropped off four or five paragraphs. It's just no, I know. I, I appreciate that. <laughs> I, and I tell you what, I, I kudos to you guys. You know, I think you know, in this world we're living in right now, everyone's looking at remote working, virtual events, how all of this is all happening. Uh, five years of consistency. I mean. I mean, I did Google Plus Hangout shows for a while. I've done a lot of live streaming. I don't believe there's another show that's knocking it out like you guys have for five years. And like I said, I've seen it since day one. So, uh, you know, migration on platforms from Blab and a lot of things. Yeah, so, yeah. My hat to you guys. You've been disrupted multiple times, brother. <laughs> yeah, oh, yes. I, I, I tip my hat. And, I, you know, thanks again for having me back on. Well, hey, thanks for coming on. We've learned a lot from you as well, from, uh, from all the changes, that's from all your, you know, from all your exploits, all your actually uh, – you know, all the technologies, all your suggestions. So uh, we've definitely been a beneficiary of uh, your friendship. So, but we're talking about what are you doing at home? Why are we all at home? Actually, I'm in an airport. <laughs> now. But what are we all doing at home? What happened to the conference event scene? Right? What uh, are you up to? Like, what, what are you re repositioning to? Because people are looking to folks like you to say, hey, what's next? Where do we go? I mean, yeah, this is interesting. You, you and Brian, you and Brian combined, there's got to be hundreds of keynotes, hundreds. <laughs> So I'm really interested, like that, this is disruptive. I mean, in our lifetime, we haven't seen this. 
I so, had 17 so, keynotes over the last four weeks. Go. <laughs> So. Yeah, I had um, I had twelve, I had fourteen events over the next ninety days, and it shrunk from fourteen to two in one day. And I delivered one last way last week to or two days ago to Berkshire Hathaway, um, and that would be my last one through June. Uh, you know, dropping off. And I can say I didn't. That wasn't a contingency plan I was set up for. You know, my that is my source of revenue. Uh, you know, it's interesting. Two weeks ago. I was at an event in San Diego and uh, you know, a, a group of speakers, all professional full-time speakers, we went to dinner on Friday night. And at the time between like the 15 of us, there was maybe $200,000 worth of lost gigs. Um, and we were all in San Diego for four days. On Monday night, two days later, we decided to go back out to dinner and really we're working on what does this all mean? And we were at multiple millions of dollars in lost gigs. And you know, not only is this unforeseen, but I think my, the original knee-jerk reaction was, oh my God, I can't believe this is happening to you know, the industry. I mean, I, I like to say I found my dream of what I wanna do for the rest of my life. And all of a sudden for the, you know, part of that to really disappear, it, it was a gut check. While at the same time, we've now learned over these days that it's much more than just speakers and events. It's yeah. everyone's walk of life. It's everything. 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 You know, and every you know, and you know, hearing you know, I've been to South by you know, we've been to South by together many times. You know, having so many friends that you know, they're 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 people that were you know, they built their entire year income off of the three weeks uh, of South by that are no longer able to not only support but they have nowhere to go. And so, you know, I think it's we're in an interesting time. You know, it's not only is it unforeseen, but no one really knows how long it's going. We can you know, link it back to stock market crashes and even, you know, previous, you know, epidemics or things that are going on. But this is different than anything I think we've ever seen. So for me, the knee jerk reaction originally was offer virtual options, throw a bunch of stuff out there and just kind of throw it at the wall. And then I think the more I sat back and, you know, I, I brainstormed with some speakers, uh, started talking to events and sponsors, I realized that you know, we're all in pain. We're all trying to figure out what yeah. this all means. And so I've now kind of looked at it and said, okay, what can I, what can we do to help each other in the short term and then redefine what a new virtual event is? I, I feel like, you know, there's a reason virtual events have never replaced offline events. Mm -hmm. And I look at that as because they can't, right? I, I don't think they ever will. But I think if we reapproach the format of content, the, the delivery of content as speakers when it comes to an online session, not just point a camera at a speaker and let them talk for 50 minutes like we do on stage, I think we're, we can redefine this entire digital experience to amplify some of those great things. And so it's um, a little bit of chaos, a little bit of knee-jerk reaction, but now, I mean, I've, I've probably had 22 calls in the last two days between you know, webinar platforms that I don't think do the job. And I, I'm very bold by saying I don't, well, you know, back-to-back -back webinars does not count as an online conference. It's called back-to-back no. <laughs> back -back webinars. Um, and so, you know, platforms I'm talking to, brands I'm talking to, events. Um, and I think we're, we all don't know what this means, how long it means. But at the same time, I think it is kind of refreshing to know that we all understand we have to do something. Uh, and yeah. I think it's just a matter of coming together. So, so let's get this right. So one day you're sitting down with all your friends eating at Bintana's wine and dine on top of the Lexus. And then the next day you come back for dinner, you're at the Jack in the Box. Pretty I mean, much. <laughs> that's pretty much what happened. Well, it, it, went, it went from the one speaker picking up the tab to we got individual checks. But seriously speaking, the last guest talked about uh, a, a, a potentially a massive acceleration in terms of adoption trajectory of drones, uh, of e-commerce. So there's all these uh, combination of uh, technologies that will exponentially grow as a result of being able to remotely deliver work, remotely, de all these universities that now are struggling and running to deliver distance learning. Now it's no longer a life have, it's, it's a necessity for their right. survival. Yeah. So remote work, distance learning, commerce, all these things are going to, 2020 is going to be a redefining year for these technologies and, and, and business model. For someone like you, who's a digital native, who has been crushing it in terms of understanding and leveraging technology to connect in a meaningful, uh, rich way using digital networks, it may be an opportunity to take you know, what you refer, reference as you know, kind of you know, shitty digital you know, webinars and turn them into maybe you have you know real time access to the speaker you're engaging with them on social channels where questions are coming not just from the people in the audience but anywhere around the globe 
you know, there may be an opportunity to really humanize the process of connecting digitally with someone by just changing the rules of the static, read the questions and be totally monotone way of typical webinars. Um, yeah, and I, you know, I, and I think part of that me, premise- Let me give you down. three points. Let me give yeah. you three points. Well, you know, and I think <laughs> part of that premise comes down to, you know, the idea of, a, a, of an event as speakers, all of us, when we take stage, we have the greatest luxury in the world. We have captured attention in a world that money doesn't buy captured attention, no one can buy more time. It is the great, I mean, it's, to me, it's the greatest honor. It's why every time I take the stage, there, I try my very best to deliver the greatest speech I've ever given every time because I feel so humbled at that opportunity. But when we move something to digital, not only do we not have captured audience, but you know, we, the, that adage of the, you know, the, the goldfish, the attention span of goldfish, we've debunked that. It's not, no one does, we don't have attention span of goldfish. We just have no time for crappy content yeah. and we have more options than we've ever had before. Yeah. And I think to your point, Bala, that is the piece. It's how do we redefine what a digital experience is? And then how do we give this audience member that feels like they have the greatest power in the world, which we kind of do. Like, I mean, we can consume phone device. I mean, I have six screens like on me, like right here, right now. And I think when I look at this, it comes down to some of the, it, it comes down to really redefining that digital value that we get. And like, I'm, you know, one of the things that I've been really working on is like, how do we create a choose your own adventure experience for an audience member, right? Like the things that you, I almost look at it and say, if I was attending a conference, what do I wish I had, right? Like I want a one track event that everything is in one track, but when the one speaker that gets on in that one track is someone I don't want to listen to, I want 15 options, right? And like, you can't there really, is. There is. Yeah, and, and, and you can do that in the digital space, unlike yeah. anything before. Like imagine you have that one live track and all of a sudden you have a podcast recording, four videos, a, a interactive chat room, maybe even a virtual reality component where people can see each other, oh, yeah. where you can venture off to more produced content, come back to something new. And for me, like it's, it's been fun to um, work with, the, I, 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 I would say work with the platforms, but it's more like them pitching me that they believe they have the answer and me coming back to them saying, let's start back from ground one and think about that that digital person that's consuming it. We've all sat through webinars and you know, what we call online summits. And I really do think, you know, the, the neat thing is that we all have all this time and all this attention and we know it's needed. The yeah. thing that I'm most worried about is we, we have to cut through the marketing, cut through some of the things that we have a tendency to do, especially in the early adopter space. So I'm excited to see that, that piece, but you know, it's a combination of the platforms need to work with us. And we as speakers, we as creators have to redefine the way we deliver content to be digital first. I think people forget this. And we were doing an online event um, for people about throwing events, you know, post coronavirus. And then if you're doing virtual events, we've been doing a lot of advisory calls with clients. You gotta, you gotta remember, it's still a production, right? It's still gotta be a production. You still gotta orchestrate it, right? Back to your point, if you're running webinars back to back, this thing sucks, right? Yeah. But you gotta remember that, you know, the people speaking, I mean, if, even if you do live taping in front of an empty audience, that's awesome, right? Because right. it's broadcast. The other thing we're seeing is like Zoom rooms, right? People are actually able to like choose different topics on the side. And yep. then how do you recreate the serendipity, right? One of the things that we suggested to a conference organizer was like, you break people off into random pairings and they go out and do something and 20 of them get, 20 of them get selected to come back with three minutes to present fast to people, create a level of interaction you couldn't do before, right, along the way. But, uh, but you know, I, I think you guys didn't, model, you guys just did a world tour. How many people actually showed up online? These weren't small numbers, right? Yeah, no, we, we, we made a decision to, uh, to shift from an in-person to a, a, a digital world tour in Sydney, Australia a week ago. And we had one and a half million people watch it, uh, wow. which was... Uh, whoa, 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 one and a half million. Yeah, yeah. Online, online uh, for an event. Yeah, that's not, it's not even Dreamforce. This is like in Australia, in Sydney. Yeah, this is, this is just... It, it's, I, I, I don't just a world tour, Sydney world tour. There's yeah, not even one and a half million people in Sydney. We promoted, we promoted it in advance so people knew. I'm looking could, up the population of Sydney. Keep talking. Yeah. We, we had great guest speakers, keynote, you know, Billie Jean King. You know, we had some amazing. So it's not that we shifted to a different platform and decided we're not going to have amazing speakers. Um, we made it interactive uh, so people could engage with the speakers. It's like if you watched a CNN um, uh, event. Town Hall. Dr. Dr. Sanjay Gupta, who in an empty in an empty room, but people would video 
<laughs> that was gold. That was, I mean, I, I must have screenshot that a hundred times last night. Not only did they have experts that were interacting. That's right. That's they had right. Skype calls coming in to interact with the virtual person that was there. You right. had Anderson narrating as a host. Right. I mean, that was, I mean, so I was. Anderson so, Cooper is like, hey, this is Joe from Kentucky. And Joe from Kentucky is now live on CNN globally. In like, in like the biggest jumbo screen you've ever seen. Yeah, yeah. But, I, so, but you know, part of that was cool. Part of that was cool too. Two hours was, long and it was captivating. It was, and they allowed, they allowed uh, tweets to come in and answer yeah. questions. You could get yeah. on video. It was uh, live streamed at Facebook. I think they, like, you know, and I, and I, Vela, I, you know, I, there's companies like yours that are, when they understand the true value of an event, are when they think virtually, they understand how they have to still provide that same value. I think unfortunately a lot of these events, and I can tell you three of the biggest events I was working with, all three of them in their own individual language came back and said, Hey, we're moving virtual, super excited about it. We've decided to only use internal talent to move forward. And if you look now, it's only their executives speaking at an event and it is just webinars back to back. And it's so boring. It is so boring. Is Don't ever do that. I know it's unfortunate because for, for part of it too comes down, you know, I, I've spent yesterday, I spent about a good eight hours redefining one of my most popular keynotes, which is press the damn button, which is right there, um, to be interactive. And it's now in eight minute chunks to where I can deliver eight minutes, we can call out to an example, we can bring in questions, and I've completely redesigned it. I mean, I've walked through it three times with other speakers, really focusing on that. And I think part of it, the onus comes on us as speakers as well, right? Like we have to, if, if we want to still get paid or still show the value that we have in the virtual landscape, we have to also be able to embrace the change. You know, like I, I, I can easily blame an event for getting rid of speakers. I can easily blame, you know, blame platforms for not creating interactivity, but if we as speakers don't facilitate that in the way that we're delivering messages, you know, we're no better than, you know, the other pieces of that as well. Right, right. Hey, hey real quick, what is Press the Darn Button about? Just so people know, just a quick so synopsis, I, so people I mean, know what to the, do when they book you. This is the greatest part right now is I think it's probably more important today than ever been before. You know, I, I think we, we all want to make the world a more empathetic place, but oftentimes we get overwhelmed. It's like, how do we change the world? We're just one person. And for me, I look at it and believe that, you know, empathy begins with me. And the only way that we can truly make the world more empathetic as individuals is we have to allow people in to hear our story. We have to allow people to be empathetic towards us. And so the whole talk is really getting people to shift their mindset on what does transparency online mean? What does it mean to actually, you know, your first impression, I don't care if you meet offline or online, um, someone's Googling your name, someone's looking you up on LinkedIn, someone's, you know, connecting with you in the CRM system to see what you're about. And I, you know, I think, you know, the, the, the main premise here is my dad raised me that, you know, your, your, your word is gold, you build trust, you don't burn bridges and you let your work do the talking for you. My, the, the first three are still very important. The fourth one, if you're letting your work do the talking for you, I, I firmly believe you'll be out of business. And it's because the world has a megaphone. The people that are selling unicorns and rainbows and faking it, they're not afraid to put themselves out there. And I believe the world has so many great people, so many great employees, so many great companies doing great things. We just haven't put it out there because we, we've lived in a space that said, Hey, let people, let people see, uh, you know, our work do the talking for us. And I think it, it takes a change. And I, you know, I get to work with some cool associations. Like I just did the association of higher technology distribution. And, you know, this is not what you would say the sexiest organization um, in the world. But for me, hearing all their great stories and the amazing things they're doing, it's like, yeah. Hey, I just need to, I need to turn this light online. You need to understand why you're doing it. And so that's where the, the premise of that comes into. It's not video. It's not social media. It's a mindset shift that says we, to, to make the world a better place to put for good people to get acknowledged for doing good things. It's up to us to tell our story. I, I'm preaching that to two of the greatest in this industry. And, and I give you guys both, you know, I think in the analyst space and in the executive space, you know, it's one of my favorite places to work, but it's also one of the hardest places to get people to see the value. You know, Dion on, on your team is one of the best at not only engaging, but, you know, yeah. creating content, being so out there. And I think for everyone else that hasn't been doing it, we understand it was awkward, it was weird, it was difficult. Today, it, you have no choice. And right now is the perfect, I mean, you're not gonna be doing handshakes, you're not gonna be doing in-person meetings. Nope. It is now up nope. to you 
Yeah, yeah, elbow, the awkward elbow bumps, which is just so awkward. But yeah, that's where, that's where Press the Damn Button comes from. And, you know, I, I, can, I use two of you as great examples of those that are doing it and doing it really well and kind of hopefully will inspire, you know, other great leaders that are doing great things to put themselves out there. Brian, we're going to have to close out. With Brian. Yeah, no, Brian, awesome. Um, quick question from the audience. What mic are you using? It sounds amazing. Um, so. Sure. So it's the, um, it's the PR, uh, it's the Heil PR 40. It's uh, one of the, you know, probably the best podcasting mic out there. Um, if you just search Amazon iSocial fans, um, I have an Amazon storefront that actually I break it down into home office, work from home, digital keynote speaker and podcaster. So you can see all my gear. I include beginner and advanced level. So depending on what you're at. Um, but yeah, that's what this one is, the high LPR. For. We are with Brian Fanzo, speaker, change evangelist. What shrink the distance? Press the button and we'll find out more if you get onto his website. Follow him on Twitter at iSocialFans, I-S-O-C-I-A-L-F-A-N-Z. Thanks a lot, man, for closing out. Right. You're Thanks, amazing. Man. Thank you, sir. Thank you. He's born to be a storyteller and he's an inspirational leader and Thank you for being on our show eight times, which I think may be the record uh, for any single guest. Amazing. We are uh, episode 181 concluded. Next week is episode 182. We're only a couple of weeks away from 400 unique guests on Disrupt TV. Next week, our guests include Dr. Mandeep Rai, broadcast journalist, speaker, and author of The Value Compass. We have Colleen Baroub, Chief Information Officer at Zendex. And one of our favorite guests, uh, media luminary, John Reed, co-founder of Diginomica. Ray, last words for uh, what hey. is an unprecedented time for us all. You know, I, I wish everybody keep safe, um, you know, protect the folks that are at risk, make sure everyone's okay in this uh, pandemic that's going on. Uh, don't panic. It is a little bit crazy at the moment. Um, I think when you see the numbers, um, as you'll see in some of the blog posts and some of the things that we've been doing, um, look, at the end of the day, there may be 30 to 40 million people infected. Getting infected doesn't mean you're gonna die. Those numbers are gonna mean something about 100, 200,000 people that are gonna be in the hospital. And yeah, we might see 10 to 40,000 deaths. It's about the same as every flu season. It's gonna be worse. We don't know yet. We just have to look at the data, but just think about it in those terms. You're gonna see some big numbers in the next few weeks. Don't worry about it uh, in that tr traditional sense. We just haven't all been tested. Lots of strategies going on here. People are being tested. People are trying to do containment. Everything's got a bunch of mixed messages. Just hang in there. It's all going to be okay. This thing has a definite end. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you next Friday. Bye-bye.